futures regained their footing after Nvidia's rocky reception yesterday. 30 minutes until the official start of trading. I'm Katie Greifeld. And I'm Shanali Basic. Matt Miller is off today, and Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. Coming up, NVIDIA pays the price for lofty expectations. CEO Jensen Wong tries to boost confidence in an exclusive Bloomberg interview. Meanwhile, OpenAI close to raising money that would value the startup at more than $100 billion. At what point are they not a startup anymore? We'll discuss. And with earnings season coming to an end, the focus is turning back to the macro landscape. Fresh data out this morning showed that the economy still holding strong. Let's take a look at where markets are trading about 30 minutes until the start of trading. You can see actually a little bit of green on the screen, which is difficult to believe with Nvidia down by more than 3% right now. But the S&P 500, the Nasdaq 100 up about 3 tenths of a percent in the pre-market. Meanwhile, the bond market right now, that 10-year yield higher by about three basis points, Chenali. That NVIDIA fallout is going to be the big story of today because it failed to live up to investor hopes with its latest results. And shareholders are on edge after an underwhelming forecast and news of production snags. NVIDIA down pre-market about 3.4 percent. We'll keep an eye on the sector throughout this show. Best Buy also reported earnings. It raised its annual profit outlook in a sign of stronger demand for its products. And you have Best Buy just soaring on the morning, up almost 16% this morning. But a different story for Dollar General, which cut its full year sales forecast as it struggles to fend off competition during a turnaround phase. And Dollar General just tanking more than 25%, almost 26% lower pre-market, Katie. So a lot of action under the surface. And also, we should take a look at the economic landscape because we did get some eco data. You take a look at GDP quarter over quarter coming in at about 3% higher than estimates of 2.8%. You take a look at personal consumption also coming in a little higher than expected as well. Maybe softening the blow from what we saw, blunting the impact of what's going on in NVIDIA right now. And there could be another reason here, Katie, that the NVIDIA downturn here, or at least in its stock, is uh, really muted when you look at the overall market. It's mm -hmm. options. If you think about it, Bloomberg News reporting that they represent more than 20% of the overall S&P single stock options notionally traded, but that 20% is still far less than the 50% or more in May and June. So a lot less interest in what the derivatives look like under the surface with this stock. Yeah, big time could, of course, help to explain why you do see the broader market being pretty resilient right now. Uh, definitely hasn't been the case in the past, but let's talk about what we actually heard from the company because yesterday Bloomberg Technologies Ed Ludlow spoke with NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wong about the supply for its next generation chips. We're expecting Q3 to have more supply than Q2. We're expecting Q4 to have more supply than Q3. And we're expecting Q1 to have more supply than Q4. And so I think our supply, our supply condition going into next year will be, in a, will be a, a, a large improvement over this last year. We're going to bring in Bloomberg Technologies, Ed Ladlow, now in San Francisco, of course, with that conversation last night. At the end of the day, the numbers were fine, and the outlook yeah. here was even a little better for some products, Blackwell than expected, perhaps. But why are investors so muted at the end of the day? Yeah, I, I mean, this morning, a, a pre-market decline of like 3%. I guess we should ask the question of whether we've gone to kind of a sell the news event rather than a macro level disaster or disappointment because it's very different to what happened in real time. And what's so interesting about the, the soundbite you played from, from Jensen Wong is that the moment the analyst call ended, the stock actually accelerated declines in the aftermarket because everyone was exasperated. They were like, come on, give us some granular detail about Blackwell. Tell us something that gives us hope. Uh, for our models, because some of the, the higher range models for the fiscal third and through the end of the year were a bit nuts, to be honest. But for me, that's the takeaway from the interview, right? He was combative and defensive and basically said, I cannot believe this because I thought I'd done a good job of explaining what's going on with this next generation key product. Yeah, and I'm glad that you spent a lot of time on Blackwell, of course, and that was the headline of the write-up from that interview that basically uh, Jensen Wong saying that we're going to have lots and lots of supply. We will yeah. be able to ramp, but sort of zoom out for us, Ed. What benefits and what advantages does Blackwell have over the current ship, the hopper right now? Yeah, performance. 
performance, essentially, energy efficiency, uh, the number of computations that it's, it's able to, to carry out. And NVIDIA has a commitment to bring a new generation of product to market annually. And actually, what's interesting for NVIDIA is it's very hard for the street to understand how companies can onboard that generation annually. So there's a whole uh, huge body of data center infrastructure that's built on the H100. H200 is ramped and is going out, and Blackwell will start ramping in the fiscal fourth quarter. Is it possible to have all of those things at the same time? You know, it takes a, a, weeks to build data center capacity or swap in new technology. But the short or complicated answer from, from Jensen was yes, you can have it all at the same time. All right. Well, of course, Wall Street waiting with bated breath uh, to see those deliveries really ramp up here. Bloomberg's Technologies, Ed Ludlow, much more coming up from Ed at the 11 o'clock hour. But stay with us now because joining us is Mizuho senior analyst Vijay Rakesh, who has an outperform rating on NVIDIA with a price target of $140. So you think about where we're trading right now. Obviously, there's disappointment out there. NVIDIA shares down about 3% pre-market. But then you consider the fact that we're up, what, 150% year to date, of course, ignoring the fact that it's up a gazillion percent over the past couple of years. How are you thinking about today's disappointment? Is this a needed reality check of, short, of sorts? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Katie. I think uh, this was kind of a little bit expected that the Black Willow is having a little bit of a delay. Uh, but that's it. You know, I think, as you mentioned, the stock's up very significantly. The 3% is really a drop in the bucket. Uh, and I think as you look at the AI space, it's still got uh, a long ways to go. If you look at NVIDIA's data center revenues this year, they'll be on track to do 100 billion plus uh, off a market that in the long term they've talked about a 500 billion opportunity. Obviously, uh, you know, very strong, a uh, very secular, strong roadmap ahead. Uh, so I think this is more a, a new product ramp where they had a slight issue, uh, a, a modest hiccup. Uh, but as uh, CEO Jensen mentioned, they continue to see Blackwell uh, supply start to improve significantly into first half 25. So. It's interesting because, VJ. at the end of the day, you have this stock declining pre-market by more than 3%. At the same time, you've raised your price target to a place where you expect it to be trading almost $20 more than where it is right now. Why did you raise that target? Yeah, I think if you look at the margins and the guide, obviously they were all above our numbers and consensus. But the expectations coming in were obviously a little bit higher. People were looking for a 33, 34 billion plus guide, and they pointed to about 32.5 billion. But again, you know, a lot of it was primarily a bit of a delay on the Blackwell. Uh, that kind of starts to come back, the supply improves into first, into first half next year. And as you look at this market, as you look at the AI market, there is there's really no competition for the NVIDIA, right? I mean, they still dominate the market. They're still growing 100% year on year this year, might be 30, 40% plus next year, even probably north of that as Blackwell supply improves. And there's really no other semi name that has a growth that's even close comparable to them you know doing 100 you know doing 150 170 billion a year in revenues with 75 percent gross margin that's incredible uh, so i think there is a lot to be said uh, about how they have grown into the ai market and really pushed the envelope on the on ai into C csps and enterprise so well, I'm glad you brought up the competitive landscape here because obviously part of the reason NVIDIA is so far out ahead when it comes to stock market performance is the fact that they have this very meaningful lead, this incumbency advantage. But as we wait for Blackwell production to really ramp up, I mean, do you think it gives a window of opportunity to competitors such as AMD to maybe narrow that lead? It sounds like no, but certainly some of the bears out there will posit that. No, I think that's definitely something to ponder. But what we have seen is uh, the lead is so strong, the performance is so good uh, that NVIDIA has been able to, uh, you know, uh, flip a lot of orders from Blackwell into the Hopper 200, the H200 that's ramping, that's seeing very strong uh, growth here in the back half. Uh, AMD, uh, in comparison, has a good hardware. Where AMD kind of still lacks is the software side because they kind of came into the ecosystem a little bit late uh, and they have a Rockham software that they're, they're trying to push and improve. Uh, but, you know, by far, 
Nvidia's CUDA is still the standard in the in the AI industry, in the AI market. Uh, the Blackwell and the Hopper are still the the gold standards in the industry. So uh, there's still a lot to uh, you know. It's, it's pretty good room headroom for them. So VJ, I understand what you're saying about competition, but let's look at competition a little bit differently here. Let's look at it in terms of competition for AI investments across the industry. I understand that Mizuho still holds Nvidia as the top AI pick. Citigroup this morning had chosen actually Apple now to supersede NVIDIA here as its top pick in artificial intelligence. Had you become close at any point to making that kind of trade-off? Yeah, so I don't cover Apple and I think, don't think Mizu as a firm covers Apple, but when you look at NVIDIA, they are really the brains behind the AI. Uh, AI market, right? And they are really the enablers of this whole revolution. So I think uh, end of the day, uh, for somebody to execute on the uh, on the AI side, you still need the brains, and that still you still come back to Nvidia. But I think the Nvidia uh, oper you know, guide, the roadmap on AI, definitely posits uh, you know tr good positive trends for names like Broadcom. Credo that report next week as well. So, uh, but in general, we would say we are, we are very positive on the AI roadmap. Yes. Vijay, we thank you so much for your time this morning. Of course, NVIDIA is really the top story of the day after last night's results. We're also going to get a look at some stocks now moving ahead of the opening bell because there have been a lot more results this week as we near the end of earnings season. Birkenstock, taking a look at that here because it's disappointed investors with an unchanged outlook. You have Birkenstock Dow down about 6% pre-market. A firm, though, just soaring. Uh, you have the expectation here of a firm to become profitable profitable on a gap basis in the fourth quarter of this year. CrowdStrike only down now about 1.2 percent. It's been fluctuating pre-market here and into early trading. Of course, CrowdStrike, people were watching very closely because of that IT outage a little earlier this summer. Stronger than expected second quarter results, but investors not chomping on that outlook. Now coming up, markets are trying to look past NVIDIA's disappointing sales forecast and turn to the focus to macro drivers. We're going to speak with Invesco's Alessio Delangis next. This is Bloomberg. And now to high interest, a look at what's making headlines around the world. Telegram CEO was charged in France for complicity in drug trafficking and other crimes on the messaging app. Bail is set at 5 million euros for the 39-year-old Russian entrepreneur. His lawyer says it's absurd to claim the platform or its owner is responsible for the crimes. And shares of Remy and Pernod are surging after China said it won't impose temporary tariffs on brandy from the EU for now. The move comes after Chinese authorities began an anti-dumping investigation into brandy makers for retaliation for the EU's electric vehicle import duties. And the head of HSBC's wealth unit is leaving the bank weeks after missing out on the CEO role after spending nine years at the bank. Nuno Matos headed the wealth and personal banking divisions, accounting for 41% of the group's revenues last year, Katie. All right, we do want to bring you some breaking news, and that is about Bill Ackman uh, allegedly seeking to revive that IPO for that closed-end fund. This is according to reporting from the Financial Times that Ackman thinking about reviving that IPO with sweeteners for investor, investors, apparently discussing, discussing offering extra shares for early investors. Remember, that was one of the concerns about why buy it in the IPO if it starts to trade at a discount. It seems that Ackman and team are looking at remedying that. That, again, according to reporting from the Financial Times. We are 14 minutes away from the opening bell, though, so let's get a check on these futures. The S&P 500 a little bit higher, as too is the NASDAQ 100, currently four-tenths of a percent higher. The small cap index, your Russell 2000, up about seven-tenths of a percent Really interesting when you consider the fact that NVIDIA is still lower uh, by about 3% pre-market after that rocky reception yesterday. Let's put it all together with Alessio DeLongis. He is head of investments at Invesco Solutions. Joining us on set, great to see you again. Thank you for having me. So you think about NVIDIA and the earnings report that we got yesterday being talked about with the same sort of importance 
as a Fed meeting, as one of these big high profile monetary policy decisions. And here we are and things are a little bit higher than we would have expected on the S&P 500 given that tough welcome yesterday. How are you thinking about the interplay between the macro and the micro right now? Well, you're highlighting really what has been the most important development in markets in the last 18 months. For the last 18 months, ever since that May 2023 NVIDIA earnings call, markets have been focused uniquely on the structural repricing due to the AI theme. And NVIDIA played, became the micro and the macro topic of the world for the last 18 months. But also why? Because the cycle was stable, the unemployment rate was stable, mm. the Fed was going nowhere. There was not a cyclical and volatile cyclical backdrop to have markets focus on otherwise. But everything is changing in the last couple of months, ever since the last payroll report, and most importantly, Powell's message. I think we're going back to now focusing on the cyclical drivers, the macro drivers, because the Fed is telling us that the easing cycle is beginning and we are a bit concerned about further weakening in the labor market. So I think today's price action, as you're highlighting, is suggesting that top level indices are able to depart now from just following the, the idiosyncratic story of NVIDIA. And with that in mind, I mean, it seems like the AI story still intact here, a little bit of disappointment around NVIDIA. And to your point, of course, you take a look at the Fed, they're not on hold anymore. We know that rate cuts are coming. We know that more likely than not, they're coming next month. Are those just ingredients for a risk rally here? I mean, how do you view the rest of the year? It's a bit more tricky than we would have assumed maybe a, a few months ago. A few months ago, you saw every time there was a pricing of more easing, um, Contrary to historical patterns, you saw small cap rallies, mid cap rallies, and outperforming large cap. While typically lower yields and Fed cuts that are driven by growth fears lead to outperformance of quality, mm. lead to outperformance of larger caps. I think we're now at that inflection point, frankly, where rate, given how we have priced already 100 basis points in cuts, any further pricing of rate cuts is actually signaling growth concerns by the market. And I think they're going to be correlated with small and mid underperformance relative to large and bond markets outperformance. That's a very interesting view. I think another interesting view that you've taken here based on quantitative assessment here is the factors that are now going to maybe start performing better given where we are with the macro outlook. What are those factors that have a chance now in this market that maybe had not before because of certain correlations breaking down? You're highlighting that very important point. Correlations have, over the last 18 months, especially between equity styles or factors relative to interest rates, have completely broken out ever since the inflation shock of 2022. We believe that they're starting to normalize. What does that mean? That if we do get into a more aggressive easing cycle, let's say more than 100 basis points that is already priced in, or the 200 basis points that are priced in by the end of 2025, in that environment, we expect large caps, quality to outperform, which has not been the case in the last 18 months. So the, the primary driver of markets in our mind is going to be a return to the macro and the cycle dominating over the structural thematic AI technology theme. Those correlation shifts can play very, very large dislocations in portfolios. You know, you made this point about growth. It's interesting to talk about growth today when GDP surprised on the upside, partially due to the resilience of the U.S. consumer. There's still so many fears about the U.S. consumer under the surface. Time and time again, they have by and large showed up. Not everywhere, but they've showed up. At what point does that stop? The answer is really lying now in the, in the labor market. Um, consumers have shown up, we've seen, we've seen it time and time again, we had the most unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus that is really taking years to dissipate. But for the first time we're beginning to see, and I quote Chair Powell, the unmistakable weakening in the labor market. We're not talking about layoffs, but we're looking at a labor market that is not able to absorb the new labor participation rate then that is not able to absorb the new incoming workforce. So uh, I think, as you correctly suggesting, looking at uh, retail sales on a go forward basis, we've seen for the last six months, we've seen a lot of volatility, and larger revisions, which means that the data is starting to get a little bit less clear. Um, I think consumer weakening to some extent is in the cards and we're seeing also likely earnings revisions are beginning to cool off.
And, I mean, if you think ahead, we get, of course, the payrolls data next week. Uh, there was so much focus paid to the revisions last week as well, a little bit delayed, but we eventually got them. I mean, do you think that the risks are now slated towards actually the Fed has to do much more than maybe they're outlining right now, that maybe the market is pricing in, if they truly are behind the curve here? I would not say that they're be behind the curve as of today. Um, but I would agree that the risks are more skewed to the downside than to the upside, meaning up until two months ago, we could say if the Fed makes a mistake, it's because there are upside risks to inflation. Today, that is no longer the case. If we, if we make a mistake, it's because there are downside risks to growth. It's another way of saying they could be behind the curve, but it's not compelling as of today that they are. Mm -hmm. Alessio, we thank you so very much for your time. That is Alessio DeLongis of Invesco Solutions. Now coming up, Victoria's Secret revealing all in its <laughs> latest earnings report. Today we're going to have details on what we mean by that in Social Climbers next. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company is making waves this morning. And first up, Dollar General is cutting its full year sales forecast as budget conscious shoppers pull back on spending. You also have increased competition from retailers such as Walmart and Aldi also hurting Dollar General's bottom line. Next up, Best Buy is raising its earnings guidance for the year. It's a sign that the retailers turnaround efforts starting to bear fruit. Best Buy execs say that slower innovation hampered shopper appetite, but new products such as AI computers and Apple's new iPads are expected to boost spending. You can see shares currently up about 15%. And finally, Victoria's Secret is posting a profit and raising its 2024 sales outlook. The intimate apparel company said that it's seeing positive signs despite consumer pressures. Wall Street is bullish on the retailer's new CEO, Hillary Super, is joining from Rihanna's lingerie brand, and Super takes the reins on September 9th. And of course, you can follow all the latest company buzz on T-R-E-N Go on your Bloomberg Terminal, Shanali. And taking a quick check on futures here, very interesting. You are seeing futures higher even after that disappointing NVIDIA print. You have the S&P 500 really up now about three-tenths of 1%. And same, too, for the NASDAQ 100. Again, despite that disappointment in NVIDIA, but still some strength in AI there. Russell 2000 futures, this is my favorite story of the week because, boy, <laughs> have they been fluctuating. But today, uh, it's at a greater margin upward than downward uh, and more so than the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Now coming up, under four minutes until the opening bell. We're going to speak with Red Needles and Barry. Of course, she has some specific stocks she's taken a look at. And of course, a view of these NVIDIA results. Is she buying the dip? We'll find out. This is Bloomberg. All right, we are moments away from the start of trading. 21 seconds to go. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Katie Greifeld, of course. We're keeping an eye on markets on this Thursday. We have a little bit of a rally pre-market, of course, even though we got NVIDIA earnings yesterday and the outlook failed to inspire, even though we're talking about enormous numbers overall. But turns out things are all okay if you have the economy growing at a 3% annualized clip, and that's what we learned this morning. Meanwhile, you take a look at the bells right now, ringing at both the NASDAQ and the NYSE. You can see the clapping cogent on the NASDAQ there, of course, as trading officially opens in the U.S. trading day. Let's take a look at what the major averages are doing just seconds into the trade. And like I said, a rally on our hands. For now, you take a look at the S&P 500 up about three-tenths of a percent, a little bit more so if you take a look at big tech up four-tenths of a percent. And that is very impressive, of course, with NVIDIA lower and small caps in charge for the moment. The Russell 2000 up eight-tenths of a percent. But let's get to it. NVIDIA, it's making a move lower now down four percent. 
that is despite meeting and beating an analyst expectations on nearly every measure. Shareholders, though, of course, are on edge as its new Blackwell processor lineup has proved more challenging to manufacture than anticipated, potentially hurting its dominance in the chip market. Again, Chanali, take a look at shares down by more than 4%. And Katie, I'm looking at a stock just soaring this morning, a firm higher by 23% at the open after reporting what CEO Max Levchin called a killer quarter. I quote, Levchin and analysts are now saying that the buy now, pay later company could turn a profit by 2025 as the consumer stays healthy. And that, speaking of the consumer, Gap reported results on their website this morning. We were expecting earnings after the bell. Comparable sales beat analyst estimates and the company boosted its outlook for the year. You now have Gap up about 7% on the morning. Let's now take a closer look at the chip sector today, the most important sector to watch after NVIDIA with Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Yeah, of course, Chanel. NVIDIA uh, down here, down 3.5%. Off the lows, though, flirting right around its 50-day moving average. So some of that near-term support trying to hang in. You can see after that quarter where they did beat, although the beat much smaller than it typically is, there was a 4% top line beat. There was a 5.5% bottom line beat, much smaller than the typical blowouts that they do. You can see the space overall, uh, you know, not so shabby at all. Lots of green on this screen. Now, what really had the stock down yesterday uh, was the guide. If we take a look at where the guide is uh, at the lows yesterday in the aftermarket's down as much as 9%. So for the third quarter, this current quarter, uh, they have guided to $32.5 billion in sales. The average analyst estimate uh, below that. However, the highest analyst estimate well above, and we've been used to these blowout guides. I can still remember the one from May of last year when sales 50% better than what had been projected. I don't remember another company having such a blowout. This was not that, so a little bit of disappointment, some high expectations. Speaking of the stock and high expectations and the chips, we were taking a look at this yesterday. NVIDIA on the year still up 147%, an incredible, maybe ridiculous amount. And then the stock's up 22%, so really a lot of outperformance there. They're going to need to keep putting up big, big results, Katie, maybe better than they did uh, last night. Yeah, and that's a tall order, of course. NVIDIA shares down right now, even though those supply chain concerns for NVIDIA's next generation chips are going to be handled by the end of the year. That is according to CEO Jensen Wong. So let's take a listen now. We're going to have lots and lots of supply, and uh, we will be able to ramp uh, starting in Q4. We have billions of dollars of revenues, and we'll ramp from there into Q1, into Q2, and through next year. We're going to have a great next year as well. We're joined now by Threadneedle Ventures founder Ann Barry. You take a look at Jensen Huang projecting confidence there. You see the market not buying it to mm -hmm. the extent that he would like particularly. But are you buying this dip? I'm not actually, Shanali. And I, the, the thought I've had through my mind all throughout this is no good beat goes unpunished. Mm -hmm. Right? That's been my theme for the last 24 hours. I'm not buying this dip because I think that... NVIDIA has been fully and fairly priced for quite a while now, and I think that's part of the market reaction we're seeing. So where else do you look at this juncture? There's been a conversation about broadening out that AI story. You're mentioning valuation being kind of the issue here at this juncture. Is there anything that's been left out of this kind of almost AI bubble that we've seen forming in the last couple of months that's worth buying now? I think tech's been really hard to find any value in, Shanali, and I know that we've had lots of conversation around the thematic I've been focused on, which is platformization. Mm. Which are these software companies in particular that are becoming these one-stop shops for multiple product lines, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses? And so one that I've been looking at and going into, actually, is Workday, which has been proving out platformization, proving out margin expansion. Again, it's not cheap. But as I look at a market that I feel is a little bit frothy, I think it's fairly valued as opposed to being overly and too richly valued. That's interesting, uh, the valuation question, because, of course, it feels like almost everything is expensive yeah. if you take a look at a stock compared to its relative history in this run-up. But at this point, how are you judging valuation? Are you comparing a stock to its own history or to relative the rest of the market? Always. I mean, that's such a fundamental question. Always, for me, it's about relative to its own history, relative to its own cash flow profile, relative to its own revenue and earnings outlooks. I think the issue with all this relative benchmarking compared to the peer groups, I mean, that is definitionally how bubbles get created. And I think particularly in this moment when 
the, the, the promise of rate cuts has been on the horizon and now we know it's coming, I think it's even more important that people stop looking at the macro and start saying, okay, let's look at, look at the fundamental profiles of these businesses. So stop looking at the macro. That's something that's definitely hard to do. But I want to take that valuation analysis to NVIDIA because yeah. especially the bulls like to say that it's not expensive if you take a look to its historical levels. But it feels like a hard pill to swallow when you think about just this magnificent run-up that we've seen. How do you apply that analysis to a company such as NVIDIA at this point? Yeah, I think the danger of looking at NVIDIA's valuation relative to its history is we need to look at the context of that history. NVIDIA's recent history's uh, historical context has been the massive head start it's had in the chip development uh, relative to some of the hyperscaler customers who are now developing their own. And over time, I think, Katie, that gap closes at the head start that NVIDIA has today, and I think still has in the immediate term. As that begins to go away, NVIDIA's history becomes less relevant, and it's about what's its current and future landscape. And I think it is going to get choppier, and as a result, NVIDIA is going to start looking more expensive again. You've been asking this question, Katie, about AI hardware versus software. Yeah. I just have a broader software question here, because Salesforce has been on the rise this morning after the profit outlook really beat because of the cost curves yeah. here. You mentioned Workday. You like yeah. Workday. Do you like Salesforce as well, and what else in the software sector? Yeah, I've really liked Salesforce as well, and I've liked things, you know, you and I talked about Palo Alto Networks in the past. The reason I've liked those has been less about the AI story. It's been less about the promise of generative AI. It's been somewhat skewed towards productivity enhancements. That's partly been AI driven, but not as the hype would suggest. For me, the fundamental story there, again, is this one-stop solution. It's going to businesses that don't want multiple vendors. That being said, I did spot a story yesterday about Klarna, severing its Salesforce and Workday ties potentially and going and doing more in-house, which I thought was a really interesting data point floating out there and frankly a little bit worrying. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to uh, that Workday call that you have, those, yeah. I mean, how, how in the weeds are you following the day-to-day -day news flow? Because I'm sure many people who are in the stock missed that Klarna story. Yeah, I, you have to be in the weeds, I think. Otherwise, you're just sort of looking at the same old stuff that everyone else is. Uh, you know, Workday and Salesforce are fascinating to me because when you look at small and medium-sized businesses in particular, and I work with a number of them, and you look at the installed base of software they're using, it's pretty prehistoric. And that's where I see the opportunity for the likes of Salesforce's and the Workdays. When you get to these supersized enterprises, on the other hand, like the Klanas of the world, I do take a little pause and say, well, how much can internal software development how much can internal use of data actually start displacing some of these service providers? And I, I, I think the jury's out there yet. It was an interesting nugget. It made me pause. Well, what do you think is causing it? Klarna being one company, but how many companies do you think might go the same direction? You have this strict focus on cost in this environment. Is it cheaper to do things at home or to go to somebody else to do it? I think Klarna's an exception. I think that's a very finite and relatively small set, which are these supersized either fintech or, or, or pure play technology companies. Generally, I think if you look at the... Uh, dispersion of the size of businesses outside of that sort of mega enterprise. There's plenty, plenty of white space for the likes of the sales forces in the work days. But it is an interesting data point for me. To me, it was more Klarna, which is rumored to be gearing up to go public, is under enormous pressure to show how the promise of AI is going to translate into real numbers. And I think that's where they're trying to scramble to find examples. Would you buy into a Klarna IPO? I would not right now. Fascinating. Right. And Barry, you're sticking with us. Don't go <laughs> anywhere. Coming up, Kohl's getting a sell rating from JP Morgan on concerns that the retailer's core business is eroding. Details next in our top calls. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. A quick check on stocks because you have the market now just shaking off any downturn in NVIDIA shares. S&P 500 up about three tenths of one percent holding on to those gains and the Nasdaq 100 flying higher seven tenths of one percent. Again, impressive despite the drop in NVIDIA. Russell 2000 now up only five tenths of one percent. The race is on, Katie. Let's keep an eye on those uh, small caps this week. <laughs> All right, it's time now for Top Calls. Some of the analyst action in focus this morning. And first up, Barclay says that it's time to buy Foot Locker. The firm raising its recommendation to overweight, increasing its price target as well. And remember that Foot Locker reported earnings and sales that topped estimates yesterday. The company also announcing it will relocate its headquarters from New York City to Florida to save on costs. Next up, Jeffrey says that Top Golf is no longer a buy, downgrading the stock to a hold 
and shaving its price target by $28. The analysts say that they are becoming more unsure about the company's prospects, especially when it comes to its debt levels. And finally, JP Morgan is cutting its recommendation on Kohl's to a sell, also cutting its price target as well. The firm says that the retailer's core apparel and footwear business is eroding Chanali. And we're back now with Threadneedle Ventures founder Ann Barry now picking up here on the consumer sector because you see so much divergence and you have to love it because divergence makes a market, doesn't it? It's finally a stock picker's market. This morning, Gap reported you had shares riding higher even though the report came out a little early, surprised investors. You have Best Buy even going higher as well. But those weaker stores are really tilted towards the lower end consumer. That narrative has been playing out. What are you buying in consumer in this market? Well, I do think that the specialty play that we've seen recently is a really interesting place to go hunting. Uh, and I, I love Shanali even just now. Like Coal's being cut because Coal Footwear's hurting. Foot Locker now getting a buy rating, yeah. right? So you've got that sort of generic, sort of general merchandiser, which is the Coal's really suffering. You've got the specialist, like a Foot Caller, uh, Foot Locker doing really well. I think some of the retailers, uh, two kinds of retailers have been doing particularly well. One is this kind of play on nostalgia, and we've seen that with Abercrombie and Fitch, which kind of blew my mind, this sort of turnaround. I remember that when that brand was like persona non grata. I wore it this morning, but I'll did be you? honest. <laughs> and, and they've done a great job of refreshing their merchandising, and they've done a great job of reinvigorating their story, which at one point was really toxic, but there's sort of nostalgia for brands like that. That's a play to me into doubling down on experiential, and you, you and I, Katie, have talked about Ulta before. Mm -hmm. Is it that beauty is a great category? It's, it's pretty resilient, it's, it's struggled a little bit, over the last year, but as a category, it, it's done pretty well. But I think the reason Ulta stands to win and why Warren Buffett thinks that Ulta stands to win is it is the definition of the experiential retailer. You go in to test, you go in to try, you go in to experiment, you go in with a community of friends. Those kinds of retailers would be on my buy list, Shanali. And it's funny, of course, Alex Steele has a phrase, invest in your face. And I think about it every time. <laughs> she we spends have. like an hour on face care every day. <laughs> it's important. She looks great. She and looks Ulta, great. Ulta reports after the bell today, so that'll be fun to watch. But I'm glad that you highlighted Abercrombie and Fitch. Of course, we spoke to CEO Fran Horowitz yesterday, and there's so many apparel companies, it feels like, that are trying to execute their own turnaround. How do they make their companies cool again? And to that point, I'm curious about how much attention you're paying to the C-suite right now? It feels like we've seen a lot of executive turnover this yeah. year. Uh, Victoria's Secret, of course, has a new CEO coming in. I mean, how much does management matter specifically in this environment? It matters numbers one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. I think it's what you think about what you can control and what you can't control. You can't control the macro. You can't really control what the consumer's going to do in retail. You can control your own bench. And I think to your point, when the CFO of Apple departs, right, that's real news. Um, there are certain uh, companies, Katie, where I thought had huge potential, but I thought just the management team couldn't cut it. PayPal is one I've talked about on this show, where I thought that is a company that has such great potential, but just could never get the C-suite together that was able to go execute. So I think given executions everything, who's sitting in the C-suite is everything too. Uh, you know, the other thing you said right before we went to break is that if Klarna went public, you wouldn't buy yeah. into the IPO. Today, we also had a firm reporting. This is another derivative of the consumer mm -hmm. play. This is about the retail uh, retailer as well. Why not Klarna? Would you buy a firm instead? No, I haven't actually gone into a firm either. So here's my position on buy now, pay later. A really clever product. Right, a clever product in the way that I think Zoom was a clever product that ultimately belonged with a Microsoft or that Microsoft should have its own version. Whether it's a firm or Klarna with buy now, pay later, great products that I think belong to as part of the suite of bigger financials, like Visa and MasterCards. So my concern, uh, Shanali, is twofold. It's concentration on the kind of product it is. I do think regulation hasn't yet reared its head in the way that it could. I think this is unregulated consumer credit that may get more attention, frankly, under the next administration, uh, number two. And, and number three, the competition is getting a lot bigger because the incumbents are trying to push back on the share of wallet that these kinds of businesses are taking. And just before I let you go, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the IPO landscape. Of course, you do so much detailed single stock work. Does the fact that we aren't really seeing a lot of these valuable companies, OpenAI, for example, yeah. $100 billion not coming into the public markets, how do you think about that as an investor? Well, let's take open, OpenAI as a really specific example. I think OpenAI, given what it's doing at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence, probably doesn't want to be doing its innovation under the public lens in terms of the scrutiny, the disclosure that's required, the pressure to hit quarterly numbers. So I put that in its own special bucket. Cutting edge companies 
you know, there are puts and takes on whether you want to be in the glare of the public eye. There are other businesses, the IPO pipeline, everyone thought it was going to be a lot more robust by now the end of the year. And I have to get your take on this. The FT reporting now that Bill Ackman is considering bringing an IPO yeah. back for his closed end fund in the United States. Yeah. Would you be a buyer? I would not. I wouldn't have been a buyer when it got shut down a month ago. I'm not a buyer now with all the kickers that are being suggested are going to be thrown in there, like access to future issuances and warrants. I think there needs to be a real differentiator. I have great respect for Bill Ackman as an investor. The edge hasn't been clearly articulated. Thread Needle Founders, uh, Ventures Founder, and Barry, we thank you so very much for all the things that are coming up in the equity pipeline, as well all of those big earnings today. We're going to talk more about that Ackman IPO and OpenAI, about talks of a fresh round of funding for OpenAI and a brand new valuation, and it's a large one. We're going to talk about that and more in our Wall Street Beat next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. Let's take a look at the stock market. Of course, about 21 minutes into the trade, you can see we have green on the screen. The S&P 500 up three tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq 100 out of nowhere is your leader. Those big tech stocks, even though we had that Nvidia disappointment, Nvidia shares recouping some of their losses now down about 1.8 percent. That had been 4 percent earlier in the session, so you can see that reflected in the index overall. And the small caps. They were the leader, but now they're not. The Russell 2000 currently up about two-tenths of a percent, Chanali. And it's time now for the Wall Street Beat. Bill Ackman considering gifting early investors in Pershing Square, USA, the right to buy extra shares in the future at a fixed price through warrants. That's according to a report this morning by the Financial Times. Here with more is Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz, who's been covering all the twists and turns of this story. What, is, what would be different, frankly, Bailey, about this offering? This, Shanali, would be a way to entice investors to buy into a closed-end fund. Traditionally, at least in the last few years, they trade well below the IPO price. They trade at a discount. So that means that if you're buying at that uh, $20 price that he was pushing, uh, then you're expecting when it opens it to trade down to $18, $17. So you would be sitting on an automatic loss. The goal with this, according to the FT report, would be to incentivize investors to buy because therefore, if the stock goes higher, you can buy back at that IPO price. So you're getting a discount in the long run. Why is he so married, Katie, to this closed-end fund structure? We've talked about this. You're like ETF queen. <laughs> You've seen other hedge fund managers really turn to the ETF structure. Why doesn't he just do that? Yeah, Scott Besson, actually, uh, among the group of portfolio managers, filing for an ETF just a couple weeks ago. And this is a debate that I've had with Eric Balchunas over in Bloomberg Intelligence, ETFs versus closed-end funds. It feels like issuers love closed-end funds, but investors prefer ETFs. But if you're someone like Bill Ackman, you want that permanent capital. A closed-end fund structure provides you that because you can't necessarily redeem the shares. It's the guaranteed fees. Exactly. And, that's, you, and that helps for Ackman pushing actual Pershing Square proper public because you have that fee But pool. even with these sweeteners, I mean, an ETF would go towards solving the problem of why wouldn't I just wait for this yeah. to trade at a discount? Are these sweeteners enough to entice them, even with that risk of this trading at a discount? Well, that'll be interesting to see. And again, this is all reporting, so we don't know what Ackman is going to do. But is it enough to bring what seemingly was less than $2 billion to $25 billion? Oof. I don't know. And that's really been kind of the calling card was Ackman has this following of people on X who would be willing to buy into the IPO. But when you saw it go from 25 to 12 to 4 to 2 to pulled, that's not showing up. Those are hard to convert into investors, to convert followers yeah. into investors, Shanali. It's a tall order. It's not guaranteed. Another tall order out there that I want to get your opinion on here, Bailey, is this open AI potential funding round. Thrive Capital reported to have been putting in here a billion dollars into this funding round. A lot of money. It's supposed to be valued at about $100 billion. However, they've been in talks for this for a while. What do you make of it? Going back to the end of last year, and really the big thing has been the scarcity value of AI names and the scarcity value of an open AI in the private markets. We're seeing investors kind of jumping over one another to to get a piece of some of these names, OpenAI, Anthropic, you name it. Uh, the fact that this is kind of dragged on longer is more interesting because it's a question of who do you want on your cap table? And also, what does this mean for a potential exit down the road? Is that a 25 event? Is that something we see in 27? Or is it similar to SpaceX where private for kind of as long as you want? Maybe well, better say private. Who knows? Maybe. I mean, I, obviously, Elon Musk agrees when it comes to SpaceX. 10 seconds. Is OpenAI a startup? 
By definition, <laughs> maybe, I guess, but a hundred million dollars and kind of being a household name that everyone knows, it's kind of hard to sell, at least to me. I don't know. All right. Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz, always appreciate your reporting. Let's get to the trading diary now. What you need to be watching this week today, the party continues. We get earnings from Dell, Lululemon, and Ulta Beauty after the bell. We also hear from Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic this afternoon. Tonight, it's that much-anticipated interview, that joint interview with Kamala Harris and Tim Walls that airs on CNN. And tomorrow, we round out the week with July's PCE inflation data. Now, coming up in the next hour, we'll speak to John Stoltzfus from Oppenheimer. He joins to talk about his bullish tech outlook and talk inflation. We're going to do that with the CEO of Dickie's Barbecue Restaurants. All that ahead, this is Bloomberg. Into the U.S. Trading Day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Katie Greifeld. And I'm Shanali Basic. Matt Miller is off today. And coming up, NVIDIA pays the price for lofty expectations. CEO Jensen Huang tries to boost confidence in a Bloomberg exclusive. And attention is now turning back to the macro landscape. Fresh data this morning showing that the economy is still strong. Katie. Plus, another step forward in U.S.-China relations. President Xi meets with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan for the first time. We'll keep an eye on that and more, but let's get a check on these markets 30 minutes into the trade. As I said, you can see really a rally is building right now as NVIDIA pairs some of its losses. The S&P 500 currently up about seven tenths of a percent. You also have the Nasdaq 100 really accelerating here. Look at it, 1.3 percent higher. You wouldn't have guessed that at about 4.30 p.m. yesterday afternoon, but here we are at 10 a.m. on this Thursday. Meanwhile, you take a look at that 10-year Treasury yield losses in the bond market, but very slight. The 10-year Treasury yield currently up about three basis points, Shanali. It's fascinating as well. You have a lot of economic data this morning, bringing you some breaking now. U.S. July pending home sales falling 5.5 percent month over month. The estimate was up 0.2 percent. U.S. July pending home sales falling 4.6 percent from the previous year. Joining us now is John Stoltzfus. He's the chief investment strategist at Oppenheimer. He has one of the more bullish calls for the S&P 500. He expects the benchmark to end the year at 5,900. And the question is, with all of this mixed economic data, with the excitement being dragged out of NVIDIA, what gets us there? Well, I think what, what gets us there are better, better earnings. We can already see it with the S&P 500. When I went to my EA page on my Bloomberg today, mm. I, I, I look, we, we've got earnings growth at over 11 percent, and uh, revenue uh, growth has picked up very nicely. It, it moved up from uh, uh, four and a half up higher than that. So all of that looks good. I think the biggest worry would be uh, uh, for Wall Street right now is really questions as to where we go uh, after the elections. Mm. We need to see who, who wins and what the policy is from both candidates and how it appears for business. We'll definitely want to more, ask more about those elections. Mm -hmm. I want to marinate for a moment on the economic data. Sure. If you have Americans who are not confident enough to buy a home, how can you be confident that they are willing to spend more money in this economy over the next six to 12 months? Well, I think, think what, we, what we've seen is in the, in the recent numbers that came out uh, from the conference board, it looked like sentiment improved somewhat amongst consumers. But related to, to home buying, the, the main thing is interest rates. And we've got to see the first cut from the, uh, from the Fed. Uh, I think a, a 25 bips cut is not going to do a heck of a lot uh, for mortgage rates. But I do think what it will do uh, is it's like a down payment from the Fed for Main Street and for Wall Street saying more to come as needed. And already my recollection is the, the mortgage rate came down to around 6.5% or so, if I'm correct, uh, just over the course of the last few days. That's a lot better than where it was before. And people get, it, it becomes more affordable as we go forward. So we'll have to see. Yeah, and of course, 6.5%, uh, it's a lot better than 7 plus percent, but it's not 4%. It definitely could be, get, be better. But as you look ahead to this rate cutting cycle that it seems like we're uh, beginning next month, 
How significant do you think it would be? How much magnitude do you think that the Fed actually has behind them as they take off here? And how much does it matter for the equity market? Well, I think it does matter for the equity market in that the equity market has been looking for a cut in rates. Uh, it most, I always think it's the highly leveraged community that has complained the most because the end of free money has been really a good thing in the sense that bond issuers now pay for the privilege of borrowing money again and bond buyers get something in return. It's a, it's a, it, it, it causes CFOs to really sharpen their pencils more, as we used to say, mm. uh, when it comes to uh, planning out for business and the responsibility of, of borrowing and investment for corporations. So overall, you know, I think, I think we'll, if we get uh, uh, 25 bips, I think the market will settle in on that. There's a crowd that wants to see 50, but then if we see 50, that's when uh, some bears are likely to say there must be trouble out there, and that's why they're doing 50 for the first. What we do they see that we don't? I can oh. already uh, hear the, them saying that. But <laughs> when you right. think about the highly indebted community that you're speaking of, yep. I want to bring this conversation to the small cap index. Sure. It's my favorite place to go. You think about some of the companies in that index. They tend to have more debt yep. and more debt that is shorter term in nature mm -hmm. than their larger peers. When you think about who really needs those rate cuts, it feels specifically like those small caps that people keep trying to rotate into. Yeah, and, and we think that, that once you begin to see the cuts coming through, and we think it's, it's 25 bips in September, followed by uh, 25 bips after the election in November, and possibly another 25 in December uh, on an as-needed basis. And, and that will likely see, when, once you get even the first cut, is liable to establish more sustainability in these rallies we've seen in the smalls. And also the, the smalls, the, the S&P 600 is a better quality small cap index. You have to, I think you have to have a, a year of profitability mm. before you're admitted there. And the Russell 2000, 40% of those uh, companies are, are, are not profitable. Plus on top of that, it tends to be the Russell 2000 is when, when the tide comes in and all ships float. The Russell 2000 leads, so it's not my favorite indicator on, in the small caps. But the 600, I'd be watching right now, and, it, and it's been improved in performance. I want to go back to something you were saying before. Earnings are going to be what drives this mm -hmm. market higher. Yeah. At the same time, you have investors who are concerned about a growth scare. They may be more or less concerned after they see the next Friday's jobs report. Oh. How do you bring this together? If you look at the macro and it's weakening, but you look at the current earnings and they're okay, uh, what leads the good. way? Yeah. Pardon? What leads the way? Well, I, I, I think what leads the way is you're beginning to see, for example, consumer discretionary is one of the best earning sectors this time. And, and just today we heard there was an electronics vendor that uh, did a lot better than was expected. Uh, that kind of thing, I, I, I think it, what leads is, is consumer discretionary. The financials are, are one of the leading sectors. Healthcare is doing well in terms of earnings. It's a broader, we've got uh, now four sectors that are double digit earnings growers in the second quarter. And uh, with that, I think we've only got two negative growth sectors. And as last I recall, uh, that was uh, industrials, which was a very modest uh, loss in, uh, or a reduction of earnings, and the other one was materials. So I, I think gradually, as you see, the sustainability of the economy, the likelihood that we get a, a, a soft landing, uh, I think that's the main thing to look for. It's right size expectations, and you might be pleasantly surprised, as we often have been in the past. Well, to bring it back to NVIDIA, because every conversation oh, has sure. to come back to yeah. NVIDIA today, I believe that you made the point well. that if you take a look at the index level, that earnings growth is expected at about 11% mm -hmm. looking forward. But as we learned with NVIDIA, it just feels like the bar is very high. These expectations have gotten to the point where they're unrealistic. So you think about what the forward ahead picture looks like. I mean, is it possible that we've peaked when it comes to earnings? Well, you know, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think we've arrived at peak earnings. I can't, I can't uh, specifically comment on NVIDIA because I manage money for the firm and we have fairly uh, strict uh, uh, parameters I, in terms of my commentary. It can be on sectors, style, and a variety right. of other things. Uh, but related to any technology company, you can't expect that every, every uh, quarter is going to be a celebration. And the likelihood that you will get after spectacular uh, results uh, of late uh, that you'll continue at the same pace. And then there's going to be competitors. Just, just in the last uh, week or so, 
uh, a competitor has arrived on screen that at least uh, says they've got a chip that can be very highly competitive, uh, you know, with that uh, with a number of companies in that area of AI. Uh, this is pretty fascinating. We were talking about how the indices have been rising despite that NVIDIA drop today. Mm -hmm. Even the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index is up <laughs> oh, more yeah. than 1% yeah. today. NVIDIA is actually the only stock in oh. the red in that index at mm -hmm. this moment. If you think about what we saw out of NVIDIA, what does this say for kind of the rest of the AI story? Because it looks like investors are largely shrugging it off. Yeah, it's, it's not only that, that's a great, great question. I, I think the, the, the reality is that uh, AI is not solely le relegated to technology. It's all the 11 sectors. So the other nine sectors, uh, uh, companies can benefit by, and they are uh, extending CapEx in, into AI by becoming more competitive, more efficient with the use of AI. So I think it's, it's the knockoff effect in a positive sense that we'll likely be looking at. So the broadening out of that AI oh. story. Uh, John, don't go anywhere. You're sticking with us, of course. But let's take a look at the stocks that are moving underneath the hood this hour. We're going to do that with Abigail Doolittle. And we've got a big laggard on our hands this morning. Dollar General down about 25%, the worst day on record, going back to when the stock, the company, started uh, trading as a public company back in 2009. They missed estimates in a massive way. They slashed the outlook. They're talking about their core customer really disappearing, not as much strength there, in part because of the customer, but also in part because of competition from the likes of Walmart. Investors clearly not liking this. That turnaround that's been promised not happening. Taking a look at the shares of the big one on the day, turning out to be less of a big deal. NVIDIA down about 3.4 percent. Options had promised a much bigger move. We did have that initially in the after hours yesterday after folks were disappointed by the guide that beat the overall estimate, but it wasn't a massive blowout, nor was the beat. Their beat for sales about 4 percent. The beat for earnings, adjusted earnings, 5.5 percent. So these numbers while still big and big growth, uh, a little bit less lofty than in the past. The stock down about 3.2 percent. And then finally, let's end on a bright spot. We do have the shares of Best Buy up 15.3 percent. This may be the best day since 2017. They beat adjusted earnings by more than 15 percent. And they're talking about the idea that customers are upgrading their uh, pandemic technology. They're looking for new technology. I will note there's a greater than 6 percent short interest on this stock. Uh, so that could be a bit of it, that the idea that this company is doing a little bit better, one of the consumer companies, we've had these mixed tells on uh, retailers are doing well or less well. Well, Best Buy seems to be one that's doing well, and those shorts don't want to be a part of it. All right, Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. And just to meditate on the NASDAQ 100, interesting to see really gains build here, even as you see losses in NVIDIA re-deepen right now. Fascinating dynamic happening underneath the surface of the market. We're going to continue to keep an eye on that. Up next... More with John Stoltzfus. And before we head to break, speaking of NVIDIA, here's the CEO addressing supply chain concerns around his company's AI chips. The demand is so great, uh, but we're going to have lots and lots of supply, and uh, we will be able to ramp uh, starting in Q4. And now for high interest, a look at what's making headlines around the world. Tesla CEO Elon Musk is hiring a Republican advisor to help steer his political work. And the move suggests that Musk will become more involved in politics and get out the vote efforts. Former President Trump has suggested recently that he would add Musk to his cabinet if the Tesla CEO had time for it. And America's top security official is highlighting Vice President Kamala Harris's credentials and experience in dealing with China's top leadership in Beijing earlier today. After a three-day visit, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan spoke with President Xi and high-level officials in talks aimed at stabilizing ties between the two countries ahead of the U.S. election. And the Supreme Court is maintaining a temporary pause on President Biden's latest push to reduce student loan bills. The Supreme Court's order will mean more uncertainty for eight million borrowers who are already enrolled in Biden's so-called SAVE plan. The Biden administration said it would continue to defend its debt relief plan in court, Katie. And we're back now with John Stoltzfus. He is Oppenheimer Chief Investment Strategist joining us at the desk. And let's stick with politics. We mentioned the election a little bit in the previous block, but 
We talk about the Trump trade. We talk about the Harris trade. If you zoom out and you think about the common denominator between both potential administrations, what do you find? Well, I think the common denominator is both plan to spend, uh, continue this, the, the spending process. And that tends to be what we find is what worries both institutions as well as private investors when they look at the longer term effect for the U.S. is what about the national debt? Yeah. Uh, the, fortunately, you know, in many ways, uh, uh, as Bill Gross used to say, we are the cleanest uh, shirt in a hamper of dirty shirts. So comparatively, if you, com if you look at the debt of other countries, uh, if you look at the accountability, uh, the transparency and governance, uh, the U.S. comes out on top on a relative basis there, which near term is good for us. But we've got to think it really it's the ele it, it's the electorate that has to get involved and right. they've it's not enough to vote if you don't like what either side of the aisle is doing related to spending you got to get on the phone or send a text and get five of your friends to do the same and get five of their friends to do the same right. and do what what in many ways uh, uh politicians have known for years the groups that support them have done to be successful to get them to pay attention because mm -hmm. politicians know one thing primarily and that's how to get reelected. Right. Well, bringing it to the investment <laughs> right. world, yeah. I'm yeah. glad that you brought up the relative value nature of the U.S. versus the rest of the world because my question to you was going to be how do you invest around this because this has been a concern out there yeah. for a long yeah. time. It sounds like what you're saying in the near term, investors don't need to worry about it, but how are you defining that timeline? Well, I'd say they need to be concerned about it, but not have it be an overriding worry at this point. Uh, and I think the, the first thing is, you know, for, I've been in this business for 41 years, 12 years with Oppenheimer, and in the 12 years at Oppenheimer, we've always been overweight U.S. Mm. while maintaining some kind of meaningful exposure both to emerging markets as well as to developed international markets. In realization that on a valuation basis, uh, opportunity in terms of periods of when global growth is good, they have a lot of old-fashioned sectors that do well at those times. But we would say it's important to diversify uh, uh, assets, and it's across asset classes. It's it's also across style, value versus growth, as well as as looking at sector emphasis and uh, taking a look and seeing where does it. It's not enough to innovate. But the thing is to see where that innovation pays off. Uh, what we were talking before, it, it, it's, it's got to be across all 11 sectors. I want to go back to this national debt issue and tie it into the markets as well. Sure. Because when you look at both sides, there is not a lot of prudence here fiscally. And when you look at some of the plans being put forward, they could impact investors meaningfully. You think about potentially a democratic plan to tax unrealized gains. How would that change investor behavior? Oh, I, I think to tax unrealized uh, uh, capital gains, that would be a very, very bad thing. And I think that that's almost unanimously uh, that I know of in, in the uh, financial community is the thinking of that. It's, uh, the question comes in, well, so if they tax your unrealized capital gains, what happens if the value of what you owe goes down? Do you get a tax credit the next year? Or when does that happen? And the disruption that that causes, what, uh, what could be a sell-off that could occur, we think that's not practical thinking, quite frankly. What about other potential issues that are being brought forward here with the way that the Harris plan is dealing with the economy, or even the Trump plan in some fashion, too? You see sure. certain sectors like electric vehicles, uh, there are worries there about what that would look like in a Trump administration. Where are the pain points, in your view? Well, I, I would have to say the, the, the pain points primarily with the Trump administration would be uh, to what level would the, uh, uh, the tariffs be elevated at some point? You know, he, he, he's always prone to uh, real estate developer uh, negotiation dramatics by saying we could go to 100 percent tariffs or whatever. But what would they really look like and what would ultimately be the effect in the past? When the initial uh, tariffs went up in the first round during the Trump administration, uh, Chinese uh, producers ate most of those tariffs for mm -hmm. one thing. And then they uh, moved facilities that manufactured to other countries where it wouldn't apply. There's a lot of things that happen. Uh, but uh, we'd have to say related to the idea of taxing higher taxes for corporations, that would likely reinvigorate what we used to see, which was uh, uh, corporations moving to Ireland and to different places to establish headquarters elsewhere. 
already it's happened with uh, with more progressive states that have higher taxes right. uh, at this point are, have lost a lot of taxpayer base to states that have more practical uh, 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 tax regimes. And John, we only have about a minute left with you, but we were having a great conversation with Rebecca Patterson a couple days ago, and she made the point that when it comes to timing when you put your election trade, your election investment on, wait until October. Things are going to change a lot. What are you thinking when it comes to actually actioning some of these thoughts? Well, one thing is we tend to be uh, investors for intermediate to longer term investors, so we're always invested. Uh, we may not be uh, always fully invested in equities or any particular um, uh, 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 area of, of, of the markets, but we were diversified across the board uh, overweight equities. We would have to think in October, we'll, we'll have to look and see what looks primarily vulnerable to uh, who appears to be ahead at that time and what would the costs of policy be. One more question coming in from a terminal customer. What level of upper U.S. debt to GDP to start causing here liquidity and auction problems here? I had a similar question. At what point does the, the budget discussion at the end of the year start to impact markets, yeah. right? I, I think it, it really that would depend on that October where we got by that point hopefully we have a better idea what policy is going to look like in terms of the near term. Uh, but overall, you know, so far we've seen uh, China and Japan and other countries reduce their exposure uh, to U.S. Treasuries. But a lot of that has been filled in by uh, individual and corporate investors who buy U.S. debt because they like the yield, they like the, uh, uh, the relative strength of the dollar, even as it weakens versus other currencies. The long-term effect uh, of the dollar uh, when you invest in, in U.S. debt is, has not been a bad investment. Past performance, no guarantee for future <laughs> results, of course. John, we appreciate your time today. That is John Stoltzfus, Oppenheimer, Thanks, Chief Investment Strategist all over these markets. And I want to hear, take a quick check on NVIDIA because we are watching shares dive deeper on the day. Now uh, about 4.6% lower. It had been as much as 5% lower. Interestingly enough, you are seeing it drag down even a little bit that Philadelphia Semiconductor Index that's now up only about 8, 9 tenths of 1%. It was up more than 1%. We will keep an eye on NVIDIA video throughout the morning here certainly one of the big stories of the day but still ahead chicken wings and chill could chick-fil-a be challenging netflix with its own streaming platform uh, we will find out in social climbers up next this is bloomberg All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves this morning, and first up, a high five for Five Below. The discount retailer is reporting second quarter sales that beat expectations. Wall Street largely positive on the report, saying that Five Below will find its footing soon again. Next up, football fans beware. Disney and DirecTV locked in a carriage dispute that could see ESPN go dark just as the college football season and Monday night football kicks off. The deadline to reach an agreement is Sunday. And finally, could Chick-fil-A soon become flick fil -A? Reports are making the rounds on social media that the chicken chain has plans to start its own streaming platform. The content will reportedly include game shows, talk shows, and documentaries. Chick-fil-A hasn't responded to a request for comment, which is a shame because I have a lot of questions. And of course, you can follow all the latest company buzz on T-R-E-N Go on your Bloomberg terminal, Shanali. I heard you laughing at that dad joke, Katie. Don't lie. <laughs> We're going to get a check on these markets now. Uh, we have, of course, markets higher on the morning. Impressive given those NVIDIA results. We have the S&P 500 now 5 tenths of 1% higher. And the NASDAQ 100, 8 tenths of 1% higher. Flip up the board. Look at NVIDIA because, of course, we have seen more losses on the day. Coming up, the latest uh, report on prices. We're going to speak to the CEO of Dickie's Barbecue on what she's seeing next. This is Bloomberg. Tomorrow morning, we're going to get the PCE price index, and that is the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation. Another month of encouraging data would all but cement a September rate cut.
Let's talk about what this means for food prices. Joining us now is Laura Ray Dickey, the CEO of Dickey's Barbecue Restaurants. Close eye here that you have on what prices look like under the surface and what consumers are able to stomach right now. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, Labor Day is around the weekend here it and is. a lot of people are going to want to have cookouts. Do you feel like you have to lower prices for them to really serve their friends and family the way they want to? We absolutely do. You know, one of the great things about holiday is the rest and relaxation, but it also means inflated prices. So all of the protein markets are up. That's chicken, that's pork, that's beef. Chicken alone is up um, over 20 cents a pound from last month. So that certainly puts some pressure on everyone in their wallet, but we absolutely have to incentivize folks with value, those right kind of deals, because everybody feels the pressure for spending right now. If you have protein prices still very sticky, still high here, mm -hmm. how do you then make sure that you're able to both keep prices low for consumers, but profits higher for yourself? Absolutely great question. It is all about loyalty. You know, that's really where we have seen such an increase in our loyalty members. So where we're able to give discounts for folks that buy more often with us, and that's beneficial to everybody. So we've seen a huge uptick, almost 16% in the past quarter of loyalty members. That's definitely something that's a win-win for both the brand and for guests. And we've also seen over $16 million in business in the last quarter that has some sort of a discount or a coupon. So it's very much um, a requirement for the business to certainly be profitable, but to offer the best deals possible. And so folks are looking for family packs, they're looking for big yellow boxes, they're looking for options that have a leftover so they can squeeze that second or third uh, meal of barbecue out of anything that they purchase. That's really interesting because I was taking a look over at your points and I see that you've only raised prices twice in the last four <laughs> years. You think about the path of inflation over the past four years and uh, definitely would make you a little bit nauseous there. But I want to talk a little bit more about really the state of the consumer because we just lived through mm -hmm. a raft of restaurant earnings. And it's interesting. You have the likes of McDonald's talking about this choosy consumer. You have Kava talking mm -hmm. about how they're seeing traditional restaurant diners trade down into yes. you know, these fast casual chains. Where are yes. you right now in that conversation? You know Absolutely. And what, what has worked well for us is that as a fast casual brand, so you come in, we have that pit smoked barbecue on site. So you have all of the artisan quality, but we're still that quick serve. It's a two minute order to pay. So you walk in and you have our pit master at the block and they're chopping and hand slicing. So you have great value. You have great quality, but we also are able to really expand to what our guests or contract to what our guests are wanting. Uh, we can offer you know those individual meals all the way up to the family pack, but being fast casual, we have casual diners downgrading to us, uh, which is where we're safe. Uh, really where the market is playing right now. But we're definitely seeing everybody from where they've traditionally spent spending less. So we also have maybe some of our more regular guests that are seeking out our value menu. You know, we've expanded that as well. And we're definitely making sure that we're very mindful that we have price point options across the menu. So folks that are really wanting to stay in that $10 plate um, as opposed to a $20 plate option, you really have to have variety because there are definitely folks um, all over uh, the spectrum that are looking for values like they never have before. And of course, we're talking about the U.S. diner primarily, but of course, uh, you have big expansion plans internationally as well. We You're opening several international locations by the end of the first four, fourth quarter, rather. Uh, we're talking about Mexico, the Philippines, mm -hmm. the U.K. How do you bring Texas barbecue to the rest of the world? What does that sort of taste education process look like? Well, and that's a great way to put it. It is, you know, there's this, still this wonderful love of Texas brands and heritage, authentic brands. We're a family brand. We're third generation. We've been around since 1941. So we bring an authenticity that I think folks really enjoy. And we bring that quality. We bring the cooking methods uh, overseas with us. And so while we have over 500 locations in the U.S. that we also are expanding internationally, we have the same base menu. Uh, we have an adoption of a local favorites, but we keep the same sauces, the same primary proteins, the same rubs we import our rubs and sauce. So they're really getting that Texas flavor. And it's really wonderful to see folks that embrace that. We have as many expats as we do folks that are really just, you know, wanting a little take, taste of Texas. You know, I want to also talk about what's happening here at home because you have told us here that you're shifting customers, shifting to curbside mm -hmm. pickup to avoid delivery yes. tips and charges. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have plans being set forth by the presidential candidates about how tips are going to be taxed in the future. Mm -hmm. This could have 
pretty drastic ramifications in terms Definitely. of how people tip, how people hire. What do you think of mm -hmm. these plans? I absolutely think one of the best things to uh, really put some um, invigoration back into the workforce is to not tax tips. Uh, doesn't matter what political side of the spectrum you're on, that would be a win-win for everybody because it immediately puts folks hard earned money back in their pockets. Uh, you know, that doesn't make a difference for us as a franchisor, as a brand, but it makes an immediate difference for our team members. So let folks keep their tips that would increase their spending power. And it's a wonderful incentive to have folks, um, stay engaged in the workforce. And we definitely have a lot of, of team members, pit crew members, as we call them, uh, that have you know that, that love of what they do, but without that additional ability to really be able to have those tips, they're having a very hard time. How do you see this dynamic playing out in terms of how you pay employees? It's interesting. We're talking about pricing, price of mm -hmm. goods, price of your goods, but also the, mm -hmm. the price of workers here, the cost of labor. Have you Absolutely. had to see a lot of upward pressure there in wages? Uh, and are you willing to really supplement that more in lieu of that pressure downward on uh, tips that we're seeing from customers. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that's served us well as a brand is that we have always paid well above minimum wage. So when folks were talking about uh, increasing the minimum wage, that wasn't something that had directly affected us for quite a while because we had already been at over $10 in most markets, uh, well, all markets at minimum $10 for a starting wage and up from there. So we were able to withstand that because we had already been there. Um, it's also, again, back to that tipped um, incentive for folks, even though our team members are not tipped employees. There's a lot of opportunity. And I think it also allows less pressure for the guests to actually be able to, to tip less and to have then the folks that they're intending to tip retain more of it. So it's a win-win all around, but it's a really nice supplement for performance and really that incentive to stay engaged in the workforce and do that little bit extra. So I think it's a net net win-win, but I do think that businesses absolutely in every aspect have to take care of team members because that who take care of, who takes care of the guest, that's who takes care of the business, that's who takes care of the quality of the food, in our case, the barbecue. So you really have to invest there first. And sticking with politics because we're just months away from the U.S. presidential mm -hmm. election. Looking at your biography, you know, you've been with Dickies for over 15 years here. You took over as CEO <laughs> in 2017. So you've mm -hmm. obviously led this company under both Republican and Democratic mm -hmm. administrations. Yep. When you take a look at forward planning, what's next? I mean, does a Harris presidency or a Trump presidency affect how you do business? You know, I'm um Great question. And since we are um, over uh, 82 years old, we have seen every type of administration. We have seen every type of political climate. In my career, I have seen seat changes on both sides of the aisle. Um, you know what? And while it definitely has an impact, I think that the, the principle will stay the same. Whereas if we stay focused on optimism, on finding a path or making one, of taking care of our team members and doing right by the guests with value, it certainly has business pressure. I do hope that the economists are right, that we're, we're all seeing relief coming uh, from inflation because we're certainly more comfortable when our guests are more comfortable spending more. But we have flexibility. We have a lot of proteins in our menu. We have a lot of sides. We have a lot of options. It allows us opportunity, not only with our size and our purchasing power to weather those type of storms, but also uh, to provide options for the guests. So while you know, certainly either administration would have an impact, we've seen it both ways and, and we'll keep serving Great Texas Barbecue either way. Laura, as a CEO of a barbecue chain here, what are you ordering for Labor Day? Oh, definitely giant stuffed bakers. That I would highly recommend to everybody. That is that gorgeous pit smoked baked potato that you stuff it with butter and cheese and sour cream and chives and then top it with that barbecue brisket. I think there's nothing better than that. All right, well, it sounds like you're gonna have a great weekend. Enjoy it when you get there and really appreciate you taking the time Thank with you. us today. That is Laura Ray Dickey of Dickey's Barbecue Restaurants. Meanwhile, let's take a check at these markets right now as NVIDIA losses camp out around 4%. Here's Abigail Doolittle. Well, we have an interesting tug of war. Overall, the bulls are winning today. And up top, CrowdStrike, not probably the stock effect a lot 
of folks expected, given the fact that they did cut their full year outlook on that debacle back in July. Right now, up about 5%. It's seen that the quarter that was and the cut to the outlook, not as bad as feared. Tesla up 2.6%. William Blair saying that their energy storage unit underappreciated. Dollar Tree down 7.4%. In sympathy with Dollar General, which is down uh, significantly, down 25%, a record plunge on uh, a big miss and slashing the outlook. NetApp, the storage company, down 7.2%. This is an interesting one. They beat, they raised, but investors not liking it. Let's take a look at uh, NVIDIA, not just today, because we do have the shares lower on the day, but on the week, right now down about 6.3%. And of course, the quarter was uh, good. They beat. They didn't beat as much as they usually do by 4 to 5% on both top and uh, bottom line. They raised, but they didn't raise as much as they could have or could have or have actually in the past and nowhere near the highest estimate. Uh, some uh, delays with key chips. So net net, we do have the stock down. From a technical perspective, we took a look at this chart earlier earlier uh, yesterday and you can see the near term uptrend in May when it started to reverse uh, created this wobbliness came out of the overbought RSI ultimately into that uh, early August drop. Now we have the shares clearly reversing the near term uptrend clearly rounding down the RSI or momentum also falling all of this suggests that we're likely to see more weakness in uh, Nvidia head. It's going to be it looks like based on this action uh, a little bit slower and more thoughtful as a opposed to outright selling, at least right now. But this chart does not speak well for NVIDIA uh, in the near term. Abigail, we thank you so very much for your time. Coming up, we're going to turn to politics, though. China urging the Biden administration to adopt a rational relationship ahead of the election. We're going to talk about exactly what that means next. This is Bloomberg. Well, today, Vice President Kamala Harris and her running mate, Tim Walls, will be interviewed by CNN in the first major interview since they announced their candidacy for presidency. Let's get the details now from Kaylee Lyon. She's the co-anchor of Bloomberg Balance of Power, joining us from D.C. So first question here, Kaylee, why is this a joint interview? Why aren't we hearing directly from Kamala Harris? Well, you will hear directly from her. She just will be sitting next to her running mate, Tim Walz. Katie, this is something that Republicans already are criticizing her heavily for, suggesting it's weak that she is not sitting down for this interview alone. I would just say that this is not something that doesn't have historic pre uh, precedent. Joe Biden did a joint interview with Barack Obama when Obama tapped him to be his vice president. We saw Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine do this in 2016. And even in July, after Donald Trump tapped J.D. Vance to be his running mate, they sat down for a joint interview just days later on Fox. So this isn't unusual, but it, it does come at a time when Harris is under more scrutiny, considering over the course of her candidacy, now about five and a half weeks old, she has yet to do something like this, answering uh, direct questions from a journalist, in this case, Dana Bash of CNN. This interview, of course, will... In uh, air at 9 p.m. tonight. We haven't really seen her do this yet. She's only been really reading from a teleprompter on stage in Chicago at the DNC or in the rallies uh, that she has done thus far. So this is going to be the wor real first chance many voters in this election cycle see to actually have her defend under uh, scrutiny some of her policy positions that she has put forward. And you make a good point that it's not unusual to see the two candidates together. What is unusual is just how compressed this campaign is. Yeah. Of course, she's only been campaigning for a couple weeks. And in that time, we haven't seen a solo appearance like this. And with that being said, what is the goal for the Harris camp tonight? What are they hoping to get out of this interview? Well, what they really want to do, Katie, is not lose any momentum that they have been able to build over the course of the last month and change. She is doing incredibly well to this point in her candidacy, both in polls and fundraising, as they've crossed the half a billion dollar uh, fundraising mark in polls, including some out today from Fox News in the Sun Belt states or USA Suffolk University putting out a national poll that shows her leading Trump uh, by about four points. The momentum is on her side. What the campaign does not want to do is arrest that in any way or have her make a misstep that could potentially be weapon 
weaponized against her and halt uh, that forward progress. It is worth keeping in mind as well that we will see uh, less than two weeks from now Harris sharing a stage with Donald Trump in the debate on ABC on September 10th. So doing this interview beforehand could kind of go one of two ways. On the one hand, if she does make a misstep, she might have the opportunity to correct it at that debate in September. But on the other hand, a misstep could be something that could be weaponized by Donald Trump and used against her in that very same uh, forum. So what they really just want to accomplish here is making sure they can maintain the status quo and that nothing about the enthusiasm and excitement the Democratic Party is currently feeling about her candidacy changes after this interview. To that end, how much do you actually expect her to bring up any new policy and any new rhetoric around how she feels about the key issues like the economy or immigration, given the tightrope that they've been walking on? Some of the proposals that they've put out already have really garnered some criticism from both sides of the aisle. Yeah, Shanali, I'm not sure this is going to be so much about new policy, but getting more explicit and specific about what her policy actually will entail. We, of course, have heard her uh, outline broad ideas of what she would like to do to help the middle class, for example, floating the idea of $25,000 down payment assistance to first-time homebuyers, doing other things to incentivize increased uh, housing supply, as well as uh, this notion of no taxing on tips, something Donald Trump also uh, supports, and uh, uh, price gouging uh, restraints on a federal level, trying to cap prices, not necessarily cap them, but control prices in some ways in grocery store. How that works exactly is what we don't know. How she plans to pay for these things, if she's talking about increased subsidies in areas uh, like housing, those are the specific details that we don't yet have answers to that she may have to answer for in this interview. There's, of course, other things she could be pressed on as well, specifically when it comes to Israel and the ongoing war in Gaza, where exactly uh, she stands on that. And she could face uh, some some tough questions as well when it comes to the border. That, of course, is one of her weaker points, something that Republicans have been uh, weaponizing against her as her time uh, overseeing the border during this administration, where she has now served for over three and a half years. So she could face uh, some, some difficult moments in that regard, too. There's another critical situation happening right now. You have uh, the national security advisor in the Biden administration, Jake Sullivan, meeting with China's President Xi Jinping. How do you expect Harris's policies to either dovetail or part from how Joe, President Biden, President Joe Biden has dealt with China, particularly because this tough on China stance has been uh, underpinning this election cycle. Well, it, it, that's exactly right, Shanali. Obviously, it is popular in Washington, frankly, bipartisan to be hawkish on China. But really what Jake Sullivan's trip is an effort to do and something we've seen this administration, including uh, Kamala Harris, doing during it is trying to normalize relations with China, at least keep a dialogue going for all of the ways in which the U.S. is trying to put restraint on China's development when it comes to critical technologies, using things like export controls. They also want to make sure that there are open lines of communication so that this relationship uh, doesn't get more tense in, in a negative way. Jake Sullivan has said in his trip to China, in which he met with Xi Jinping, that Kamala Harris does have the foreign policy experience, that she is well known to Xi. She, of course, has met with him on the sidelines of a summit in Thailand, though she has not uh, visited Beijing herself during this administration, but essentially that she would adopt very similar policy to what Biden has adopted in trying to normalize this relationship. Of course, for China, they have to consider what a Harris policy might actually look like relative to the other possibility, which is another Donald Trump presidency, knowing that Trump has threatened 60 percent tariffs on all Chinese goods uh, has been very hawkish on the, the trade rhetoric specifically. And that's something I'm interested to see if Kamala Harris may get pressed on tonight. What exactly she would like to do in terms of trade with China, knowing that this administration she has been a part of has largely left intact the tariffs that were put into place during the Trump administration. Is that something she wishes to continue? Does she want to see those expand? We don't necessarily have uh, much clarity into her thoughts on that yet, but those could emerge tonight and in the coming weeks. Well, you touched on this a little bit, but compare and contrast here what we know from how Donald Trump would handle the relationship with China. Of course, it feels like both sides of the aisles are sort of united in that they want to be hawkish on China. But uh, Donald Trump, we have more specifics there. Yeah, we do. And it also comes from his running mate, uh, Senator J.D. Vance, the vice presidential nominee on the Republican side, was actually taking direct aim at China when he was in Erie, Pennsylvania yesterday, talking about how more things should be made in America. It's this kind of protectionist pol uh, populist policy that we have seen both of them espouse in a more vocal, outward way than we necessarily have seen uh, from the Harris Walls ticket to this point. Donald Trump, in addition to talking uh, about tariffs he would like to see put in place on China uh, of 60 percent plus, of course, has indicated those tariffs could be a, a blanket policy 
policy, 10 percent on all goods coming into the United States. But there also is this kind of counter notion as to whether or not China would actually welcome a second uh, Trump presidency. Of course, you had the phase one trade deal that went in place during his first administration. There is a thought in some uh, circles. I was speaking with Mary Lovely of the Peterson Institute about this yesterday, that actually he could be friendlier to China, allow China to do more uh, in terms of exerting its own uh, territorial, territorial authority in its mind in Taiwan. This notion that maybe Donald Trump wouldn't be so eager to jump to Taiwan's defense, considering he actually suggested in a Bloomberg Business Week interview with a few of our colleagues here this summer that he thinks Taiwan should be paying for its own defense, that the U.S. shouldn't be contributing in that way. So it's kind of a, mm -hmm. uh, a two two-sided story here. On the one hand, tariffs obviously potentially could be detrimental to Chinese, uh, China's economy. On the other hand, geopolitically, you could, you could see how there may be some things China would actually be looking forward to. Kaylee, we're looking forward to your coverage later on Balance of Power. Of course, that is Kaylee Lyons, co-anchor of Bloomberg Balance of Power down in Washington. Now coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get to the trading diary. What you need to be watching this week. And today we get earnings from Dell, Lululemon, and Ulta Beauty after the bell. Really interesting check on the state of the consumer there. We'll also hear from Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic this afternoon. Of course, Fed speak continuing to pour in here. And then tonight, the big interview. We're talking about Kamala Harris and Tim Walls sitting down for a joint interview on CNN. We'll keep an eye on that one, of course. And then we round out the week tomorrow with July's PCE inflation data, Shanali. I'm going to check on these markets because what a day. You have the S&P higher, near session highs around 8 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ 100 up more than 1.3%. And NVIDIA down 2.6%. NVIDIA not even the biggest loser, though, in that NASDAQ 100. You have Dollar Tree taking that spot. Fascinating. Uh, the NVIDIA story is actually the only down story in the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index today, Katie. It's really remarkable. I mean, if you had told me this yesterday that NVIDIA would be disappointing, but still the broader market would be uh, meaningfully higher right now, including the stocks, I wouldn't have believed you. But Session highs. Here we are. All right. Coming up tomorrow on Open Interest, we'll speak to Elias Sabo. He is the CEO of Compass Diversified. He joins us in the C-suite. We'll see you there. This is Bloomberg.